Hello everybody, thank you so much for inviting me to come along and talk tonight. Uh, I've done five talks now in two days, so um, I'm sure as hell sick of listening to myself, so I understand if you get sick of me along the way. Um, okay, so the story so far, so my name's Calvin Hasty, and about uh, whew, three years ago, I saw a weasel out the front of my house, and um, I thought that was a bit odd, really. And then I walked up the road a little bit further, and, and at the mitre 10 there was a rat in the flax bush. I thought that was a bit odd. And then I walked up a little bit further, and then there was a broken milk powder container on the, at the countdown on the ground, and the rats were running out of the bank, eating, feeding on the milk powder and then running back in. I thought that was a bit odd. But the oddest thing about it was the rats looked really happy. You know? <laughs> they, were like, they weren't like sad looking rats. They, were, they had these, the big grin on their face. I mean, they were loving it. Crofton Downs was obviously one of the rattiest suburbs in New Zealand. <laughs> so I kind of started to think about this, well, especially with the weasel, because I, well, actually, I don't know if it's a weasel or a stoat, because I couldn't tell the difference between the two. But I thought that the weasels and the stoats lived in the misty mountains with the kiwi. So I was a bit shocked when I found one outside the front of my house. So uh, you have to, have to understand, I was completely naive and I knew absolutely nothing about the environment. It hasn't ch changed much up to now, but bear with me. So um, I started researching all the issues around these predators and tried to understand why we were going backwards and why we were spending millions of dollars of money that every article you read in, sort of in the media or in the newspapers says that um, most of our species were going extinct. Um, I just couldn't quite fathom that, really. Um, so I, I sort of started analysing all the issues and trying to understand, look, is there a way as our community that we could do something positive to try and turn that around? So one of the first things I, I tried to understand is, you know, what, what are, is that key issue? So instead of focusing on the bird species in our reserve, I flipped it on its head a little bit and thought, what if we engage the whole community? So um, why, what if we try and get every landowner in Crofton Downs to trap on their property? So as opposed to just worrying about the reserves, let's try and get the whole community on board. So that's one of the first things that we tried to do. That's me. Screws the ugly photo, but it's the only one I've got. Uh, someone wrote an article about me called Don't Get Mad, Get Trapping. Uh, could be a Tom Cruise blockbuster. One man leads an army into battle against thousands of relentless predators. However, it's not a movie yet. I doubt it'll ever be a movie. Anyway, um, you know, have you seen Tom Cruise run? It's not, it's not pretty. I run far better than Tom Cruise. <laughs> uh, so that's me, Calvin Hasty, with a K, not a C. Just remember that. I'm founder of Crofton Downs Predator Free Community because of the weasel. Uh, I'm Next Foundation Predator Free Community Champion, which is a fancy name for Next gave me some money. Uh, I'm Wellingtonian Environmentalist of the Year, which is, I had to stand up there and say, well, thanks for the award, but I actually know nothing about the environment. And I'm also instigator of Predator Free Wellington, which, uh, you know, obviously there's a bit of competition here tonight, and I don't actually want to give anything away. So, uh, there's nothing in here that you're not going to learn anything tonight, because I don't want Predator Free Hamilton getting anywhere near Predator Free Wellington's goal of becoming the first Predator Free city. So, everyone loves a good story. Uh, so, yeah, it's kind of weird, because when we started Crofton Downs, we did, I, we, I certainly had absolutely no idea what I was doing, but um, there was a competition uh, run by the Morgan Foundation, who you all know Gareth well, and uh, it was a competition to try and become New Zealand's first predator-free community, and the community that could achieve that goal um, and won the competition and got $5,000 to start working on that. So I was the only person that wrote a plan. So that definitely gave our community a clear advantage. Uh, 
uh, sure what I wrote. I had, uh, you know, I had been investigating an issue, but it was a bit wobbly. But it did put me ahead of the pack at that stage. Uh, yeah. So look, everyone. What we've found along the way is everyone loves a good story, and predator-free communities is a really good story. Keeping it simple. So we had one of the first things I did was I spoke to the communi some commun existing community groups. And I went in and I said, do you think this is a good idea? And I expected people to say, were well, you crazy? This is a stupid idea. But everyone went, hey, what a cool idea. And some people went, oh, I've never even thought about trapping rats in my backyard. And at that reason, I realised we had a real problem. Uh, so my father, he was raised during the Depression. I'm the youngest of eight. He was the youngest of 11. So, uh, you know, all of our veggies were growing in the garden. And, uh, you know, I realised that you know, there's a huge disconnect nowadays between the environment and um, people not even understanding that they might have rats in their backyard and that trapping rats might be a good idea for whatever reason. So uh, we had a community meeting and the Morgan Foundation from Enhancing the Halo came along and Nick Tansey was there, he's a wonderful man. You might remember him from, I think, was it Sale of the Century? Uh, one of those shows from many years ago. And uh, he bought a lot, put a Doc 200 on the ground, and you know, the community showed up like this, and he set it, and he got a roller, and he stuck it in there, and set it off, and went, hey! And I looked at the, uh, everyone's faces, and they were like, oh my God. <laughs> we need to get out of here immediately. <laughs> I realised, so one of the things I th thought early on was we probably don't want to catch um, people's cats and we probably don't want to catch small children. <laughs> I didn't quite understand why that was, but as I've gone through the process, I, I understand why. So um, we know that stoats have a, a and John and us feel free to jump up and tell me I'm wrong at any point, but we know that stoats generally have a range of around sort of 60 to 100 hectares. And since our sections in Crofton Mounds are 400 metres, square metres, we thought it was pretty unlikely we were going to find stoats in our backyard. Uh, we also know that weasels have sort of around about a five hectare range. And once again, I kind of thought it's probably pretty unlikely we're going to have to track weasels in backyards either. So now we're up to around 8,000 catches, um, I think. And um, we've caught maybe one weasel in the backyard, and even though I think that was down by a stream gully. So we're not, we, didn't, we haven't found many weasels or stoats in people's backyards. So the only advantage of us really for having the Dock 200 was uh, more for hedgehogs, but hedgehogs went on our list because we know some people love hedgehogs. They absolutely love them. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But, um, so, we, we gave people a, a box, like you probably, most of you already seen, and with a mesh in one end and a hole cut out, and we stuck a rat trap in there and said, there you go, have it for free, it's yours. The only conditions is you need to report what you've caught, and you need to keep it baited at all times. So that was, that was the conditions of them giving away. So, we took away all the lots of traps that you could have, and look, there are a lot of different traps you could have, and we just kept it really simple because the people in that community just wanted to kill rats. And later on they moved on to mice as well. Yeah. One of the first things was, once again, people were a bit worried about cats, and they were a bit worried about their small children. So we, by putting the trap in the box, it quickly allayed that fear of we, we were actually making our community safer, right? Sure. I thought it was a funny line, but people really liked it. So, um, and we also made it a bit more humane for the animal because when it comes into the tunnel, it's lined up and it hits the trap at the right, the right, the right way. Whereas. In the old days, people would put their trap out in the yard, the child would stand on it, the cat would stand on it. But more importantly, a rat would catch it on its tail and run a couple of kilometres in the other direction and suddenly their trap would disappear. So we didn't think that was a very good idea. This is one of our group leaders in uh, Wellington. 
Sometimes the job of protecting endangered wildlife sucks. The most important thing we can do is be as humane as possible. There is no joy in killing one species to save another. Some people disagree with me on that, or say on that. Let's stick with that for now. Uh, but the fault is ours, and we must own it, accept it, to move forward without guilt. What are we handing over to our children otherwise? I think one of the most interesting aspects of this journey has been the amount of vegans who now take great joy in sending me photos of dead rats on my cell phone. Um, I think the other most intriguing aspect is a Buddhist family who said, we can't kill rats, but we sure as hell will do the admin to help you kill them. <laughs> so we've had some unusual social outcomes come about through this whole process. So, what is a predator-free community exactly? Well, you know, initially I thought we were just killing pets, but it turned out to be a little bit more than that because it became a real community building exercise, you know? Like, it's not often you get this many people nowadays that turn up to a public meeting. Um, we just recently did the launch of Predator-Free Brooklyn and 600 people showed up on a Saturday morning. The scouts were doing the sausages, they had a cafe on one level, they had stalls on another level with stands, and they had a production line of the traps being shown, how, how to use them safely, and then on to the next person, and then the person signed them up and out the door, and away they went. And yeah, 600 people turned up for that. It was crazy. But before that, one of the first communities that started after Crop and Downs was actually in Potty Rua, and this is Heather here. You can see her up there in the corner. And um, I got a phone call from Heather one day and she said, Calvin, can you come and talk to me at my house about starting a predator-free community? I'm like, sweet, that sounds great. So I went down there and she sat me down on the couch and there were actually three women and they said, they're now called Pest Destruction Agents, <laughs> PDAs, that's what they've named themselves. <laughs> And Heather pulled out a good-natured self-resetting trap and she said, Calvin, this is what we're going to use. This is awesome. And I said, sorry, Heather, but you're not using that trap. And she went, no, no, this is what we're using. I said, no, sorry. Um, see this box trap? This is what we're using. She says, but then you have to pull a dead rat out of a, out of a trap. And she says, there is no way ever I'm going to do that. Heather is now known as the Black Widow of um, <laughs> She's, Pimerton has killed around a thousand rats now as a community and uh, they're well, well on their way to being a predator free community. So it was a Saturday morning, 120 <coughs> people turned up. Pimerton's not a particularly large suburb, but we had 120 people turn up on that Saturday morning. As one of the councillors said to me, uh, to, to me the other day, it gets people out, doesn't it? <laughs> Okay, so there's Crofton Downs at the top there. We now have around 22 backyard groups in Wellington. But in actual fact, I think we're now up to around 27. We've got about two suburbs left to go. So don't think you're going to catch up with us, all right? <laughs> that ain't going to happen. Um, yeah, so we tend to get a champion to put their hand up from each suburb, and we're aiming to get one in five people trapping in their backyards, because we did it in Crofton Downs over a year, and we ended up monitoring zero. Now the experts tell me zero isn't zero, but for us zeros, we're pretty happy with zero. Don't, you yeah, don't ask me the difference between zero and zero, but there is a difference between zero and zero. <laughs> so this is what the groups kind of look like. This is a bit old and out of date, this map. So Karori is now away, which is actually the largest suburb in New Zealand, I think. Um, Loyal Bay is away. Uh, Tawa and Newlands are away. And someone's put their hand up for Johnsonville. So we've literally just got a couple of suburbs there. So they're all at varying stages. Uh, you can see Crofton Downs up there. It's number 32. And that's the biggest community. And that's because I had to have the biggest community. <laughs> So I made sure it was just really big when I started. And um, no one's bigger than that. And, um, but what I did was, because we cleared Crofton Downs, I then got our surrounding suburbs to try and lower our re-invasion rates. 
So um, we've now got Wilton, Wade's Town, uh, Kendara, and Northern and Nio around us still trying to do the same thing. And Nio is about five times the size of Crofton Down, so it's been really interesting to see um, the challenges, and it's also really ratty. <laughs> so, does anyone know anyone that lives in Nio? <laughs> Tell them to get out now. <laughs> It is far rattier than Crofton Downs was. And we just think there's a lot of waterways in Nio. If we count the waterways, there's not many waterways in Crofton Downs. But the two stragglers are Wilton and Nio. They've both got quite a lot of waterways, but they're getting there. We think we're pretty close to those numbers really starting to, to, to drop down. Most of the communities do a Facebook page, and that's, you know... You know, like, at, at our age, Facebook is still cool. Unfortunately, we're actually uncool. We think it's cool, but it's not cool, because all, uh, all the kids do not want to be your Facebook friends. So they've actually moved to something else. So, yeah, so they're on something else, okay? But we tend to use Facebook, um, because it suits our demographic. And... Uh, it's a pretty good way to communicate, but a lot of people aren't on Facebook. And what we find is a lot of people on Facebook are from other communities spying on us, <laughs> watching what we're doing, like people in Hamilton. <laughs> so um, it's not a great indicator. So look, the best way to get people on board is an A5 black and white flyer. Non-glossy, just with a few words on it, depending on what you want to say. So we want to be a predator-free community. And then you can get it in the non-circular one. And then you don't have to peel the non-circular sticker off to put it in. You can just put it in. Because it's community. Black and white community. So you can just bung it in there and you can walk away. And if someone comes up and says, Oi, what are you doing? You're like, community. It's brilliant. <laughs> and there's a lot of advantages with this predator-free community business. Because not only that, there's no health and safety in our backyard. No one can tell us what to do. We can, we can get the tallest ladder we can find in our garage, put it up against a tree, climb to the top and nail the trap up there. And the council can't do anything about it. <laughs> I've had a few nasty uh, letters from ACC, because I've seen a few of these talks. But, um, you know, health and safety is such a huge bureaucratic layer of hopelessness that um, we don't have in our backyard. So that means we can mobilise really quickly. And that's what, as, as you've seen with our groups, we've mobilised really fast because we don't need to ask permission every time we're going to do something because it's our backyards, it's our land. Okay, this is one of my special favourite guys. His name is Jim Tate, and he's special and favourite because he did not only doing Predator Free Wilton, but he's doing Predator Free Wade's Town as well. And he's also doing Atari Wilton, which is one of our remnant blocks in uh, Wellington. It's, uh, it's wonderful. If you've ever been to Wellington, yeah, Atari Wilton Bosch, it's beautiful. So it's New Zealand's only indigenous species native species botanic garden so it's, it's a really lovely place to go and there's some species in there that are on the brink of extinction that they're bringing back it's fantastic so uh, yeah he's been doing rambo for about five years now i think and they're they're currently monitoring at two percent for rats so and there's no possums in there so it's pretty low he's doing a pretty good job so over the last five or six years, they've caught about 550 rats in Atari Wilton and the reserve. Across the road in 12 months, he's caught 1,000 rats. So, sorry everybody, but your backyards are bloody ratty. <laughs> yeah, so that's Jim. He's a, he's a good bloke. And he's one of our champions. So we try and get a champion like that to his hub early. He, he writes these amazing newsletters. Like, I'm sure they're about 12 <coughs> pages long. But the information in there is just incredible. And uh, he, he's very naughty because he feeds Kaka in his backyard with grapes from his mm -hmm. hand. And the Kaka, he thinks they're nesting in one of his trees in his backyard. And from what I've seen, he's right. 
Um, and I've been getting up to my goodness back here. So, you know, it's an amazing story of here's a guy who's brought Parker back into his, his backyard, and we live in the middle of an urban environment. So, by people giving us their data, um, uh, you know, we can get a picture of what's going on. So, from about January this year, he hasn't been able to get under 50 until um, just this last month, he got 40. He sent me the email the other day, he's got under that 50 barrier, it's been really tough. But you've got to realise he's been adding traps all the time. Adding traps, adding traps, all the way through. Now it is one and five, and then he'll find a hot spot down in a little bush gully. And I'll put a trap down there and I'll catch 10 rats on one trap. Bang, 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 and then it'll stop. So, it's, you know, he's got to find all those hot spots in his community before those numbers actually come right down. Um, but, you know, his enthusiasm just is infectious. So his whole, whole community love him so much that they want to kill rats for him, <laughs> which is just brilliant. So we, we're, not getting, we're not finding engagement drop-off. We're not finding that people are not stopping traffic. Um, if anything, we're just finding it increasing more people are coming on board all the time. Because all you've got to do is keep your trap baited and set all the time. So the bureaucrats will tell you, this ain't going to work. Um, people are going to get sick of it. It's just not going to work. But we as communities are going to show them we're going to prove them wrong. So um, this is actually someone's house in the audience. I better keep this secret. I can tell you that's a bloody big rat right there. Okay? <laughs> it's not a cat. It's the butt of a rat. <laughs> that rat ain't going to fit in the trap. <laughs> so um, this particular person, who's not really from Hamilton, I just said that, this is actually Wellington, um, really loved to feed the kaka. Because, you know, we all love to feed kaka, don't we? If you feed the kaka with the wrong foods, then probably still does. It's not good for the kaka. She gets about 50 kaka to her house every day at about 3 o'clock, which is pretty awesome. But we went to her house and we looked further than the kaka and looked over the edge of the deck and we noticed there were a few rats there. Some quite large ones. In fact, that's not one rat there, that's probably about 15 rats. So <laughs> that, that one trying to get in the tunnel. So. Um, so what we've found in the communities is people are standing up and reporting these situations because they're a bit sick of this sort of carrying on. So in uh, another suburb of ours, the neighbours stood up and complained about one individual and they found 200 rats in a 200 square metre section. They think that's a record, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> um, we love records. Yeah. And... Um, you know, that's, that one house is enough to reinforce probably the entire suburb, not just their house. So we find most people are like, um, most people are not that into having rats at their house, but occasionally um, you do get other people. But in this person's defence, they weren't happy about the rats either, so we went in and with the council and they trapped 50 rats in there, 50 Norway rats. So one of the problems that I had initially was uh, we did crop and downs and then the next foundation agreed to give us some money to scale up. We kind of needed a GIS system platform and the last thing I needed, wanted to do was to invent, reinvent something that I knew was already around. But unfortunately some of the other platforms that I wanted to use just didn't quite have what I needed. So we created our own. And uh, GIC, which stands for GIS and Conservation. Um, one particular chap from that, who is a volunteer, spent his Sundays building this GIS platform. Um, I feel a bit sorry for the guy, he obviously doesn't get out very often, but um, it helped us a lot. Um, so, as you hopefully he doesn't watch this video, can you edit that bit out? Um, so, you can tell, see what it does. It, 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 we can view it in a number of ways, um, but this one here is dynamic, so we zoom in, those circles sort of get spread out, um, and if we zoom in, they get bigger, I think. So 
we can tell just from that one view that there's 1,362 um, households chirping. That's now up to 1,700 these maps are a little bit older. Um, but it just was a really useful way because the Next Foundation wanted to make sure I was giving the tracks to the community and not selling them back to, to the Australians. <laughs> Fair enough, it's fine. And then it also does pest calls as well, so we can zoom in and out. We can do the whole of Wellington and see how many pests have been caught or zoomed down into a street or into a little... Uh, once again, in that view, we're now up to 3,200 rats and mice, I think, which is pretty cool. So there's the dottiness of it. So if we log them in dot by dot, once again it's quite old, so we've got a lot more dots in there now. But um, I, I get a little bit sick of constantly updating the, the talk, as you can imagine, because this thing's moving so fast I can barely keep up, really. So there's the residential urban, and I just kind of identified that as the major gap in our community. And then if you look, these are residential trapping. So some people have been trapping for many, many years in the reserve. So we started working in with those people. And we find that a lot of the predator-free groups, they do start the back cow, but then about 5% of people want to move into the reserves. So we end up with the urban space done and then the surrounding landscape. And when I say reserves, I'm talking one hectare playground. Because uh, it's all about doing every inch of, of the suburb. So people are taking on little playgrounds, little scrubby valleys, just whatever. It doesn't have to be the traditional view of a reserve that we might think of. And then if we look at, uh, you definitely need to edit this out. So if we look at this, this is Greater Wellington Regional Council's base station network. Uh, and if we kind of put the picture together, you can kind of see that um, predator-free Wellington is perhaps possible. So this, this, this here is coming around here. We're probably up to about here now, but it will come right down into this corner. So it's quite a lot of work, so we'll give them a break. They'll be a lot further on than my map shows. But, um, so, and, and that's a, called the Rural Possum Control Program. So for $6 per hectare, because that's all rural landscape out there, People can pay $6 to get their land um, looked after by the Greater Wellington Regional Council, $6 per hectare per year. So, um, and they do it at cost, I think. There's no profiteering going on here. So it's a great, it's a win-win for everyone because our possums are coming back in from that, that way, but also the birds will spill back into the rural landscape, which will be pretty awesome. And there's our hotspots of density of control. So that blue area up there, that is the open green rural landscape. So obviously we need a little less control. And then that's probably some of our high value reserve remnant forest uh, in those hot areas there. And there's one particular landowner really letting us down, and it's this one here. Um, they're called Zealandia. <laughs> but, um, yeah, apart everyone else is doing a really good job. <laughs> so, uh, so what do we know about Wellington? Well, the great thing about Wellington is that Wellington City Council has been doing bird, uh, five-minute bird counts for many, many years. So, and there's been a profiteering bait station network running for 25 years. So that has meant that before we've even really started predator-free Wellington, we're sitting at. Uh, 5.8% tracking for our reserves. So we're starting from a really strong position. Sort of when you get under 5%, you could start to argue, you know, what effect is it actually having on our um, bird population? <coughs> so we're pretty lucky. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm basically a politician. I looked at it and went, oh, we're pretty close. So I'm just going to pretend that it was all my idea. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the next foundation said to me, um, Calvin Y Wellington and I said because I think most of the hard work's already been done. <laughs> so I've been helping out groups um, around the country as well and here I am tonight and that's uh, pretty cool and that's part of my champion role um, which I'm not too comfortable with but um, 
it's just all about helping other communities out. It's meant to be fun. And uh, I was kind of joking about the whole secrecy thing. So. <laughs> Here's me uh, at a photo opportunity. No, I no, sorry, actually, it's the launch of Fraser Free Wellington. And um, we brought together the Next Foundation, Wellington City Council, and Greater Wellington Regional Council to sign an MOU to look at you know, how do we create a predator free Wellington. I think, you know, because we've engaged our urban communities, um, we've seen a lot more interest from some sectors in government um, for various reasons. But yeah, but when you start to uh, engage people and get people in the process, then change seems to happen a lot quicker. So we did a survey for Predator Free Wellington and 99% of people are for Predator Free Wellington. Uh, I haven't met the 1% people yet, but uh, when I do I'll let you know who they are, but uh, presumably they're rat owners, pet rat owners, I don't know. So, you know, I don't think there's ever been a 99% support for anything really. Uh, so that's, you know, for Predator Free Hamilton maybe that's something you could look at doing as well. Is, undertaking a survey of your city to see the attitudes to pest control. You'd be welcome to copy ours, I'm sure. So recently we did, so the, the partnership between the three partners is predominantly going to focus on Miramar, and the reason for that is it's defendable. The main reason is it's a defendable peninsula. So there's, there's a lot of um, households on that peninsula. I, I'd be guessing uh, it's in the thousands. And, um, you know, this has never been done in the world, you know, trying to clear an area like this in an urban space. Uh, it's, a, it's a lizard hotspot. So although we won't get the bang for our buck on birds, um, this is one of the best lizard habitats in the country and there's a number of species hanging on on that peninsula. So we're going to see a real bounce back from that. So what we did was we set up 200 metre two card test. So every 200 metre we put a two card. And we have this wonderful um, individual from Greater Wellington, Philip, Dr. Philippa Chris, who was like, uh, we got to put the two cards on the runway. <laughs> and um, the people at the airport were like, no. <laughs> I don't think we're going to put the, the two cards have to go on the runway. <laughs> sure enough, the two cards went on the runway. <laughs> so, um, they're not, you can see they're not quite on the runway, but these guys had to sprint to the edge of the runway, put a two card in and then sprint away. <laughs> uh, which is awesome. And, you know, it's great to have Wellington Airport just providing that sort of support. Uh, and then... So I think there was, these two cards went out in a day and then it took a day to take them back in. So this would be the largest two card run in the world ever done in an urban environment. And we did it in a couple of days with not many volunteers. It wasn't actually that hard. There was a lot of health and safety around it because we had Greater Wellington and Wellington Swift, but we let them handle all that, we didn't get involved. And then we just had our, we got briefed on health and safety before they put the cards out. I'm not sure what health and safety there is about putting two cards on a runway, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> we monitored 50% for mice, 12% for rats. So rats are already pretty low. Um, does anyone know what we monitored for possums? Oh, come on, Zero. somebody. Zero. Zero. Oh, you saw me talk before. <laughs> Cheeky. We monitored zero for possums because there's no possums on Miramar Peninsula. They've already been eradicated. So all this talk about predator-free, 250, it's impossible. We've already got rid of possums. It was easy. So, um, and then I think we got 2% for mustelids. So um, there's a couple of weasels on there. So we don't really want to spend too many, too many millions of dollars for two weasels, you know? Um, and we probably don't want to spend too many millions of dollars for 12% rats, which is already not that high, 
it's not a bad place to start from. So by having the communities trapping in their backyards, if we can get those numbers as low as we can, and then we'll send in, I don't know, sniffer dog or something, to find the last ones. I don't know, but... Um, so that's what's happening in Maramana, and that's the focus is on there at the moment. And then hopefully uh, we'll have a whole bunch of... So what we've noticed in Crofton Downs, the forest geckos have been popping out in people's backyards. They've become a lot more visible. Apparently they're not that common anymore, and they're just appearing on people's decks and stuff in their backyards. And the green geckos are popping out a lot more as well. We're seeing them around a lot more. So I think the lizard experts tell me perhaps it's not the increase of the population, but the fact they just feel a bit more comfortable. I'm no expert on anything, so I'm not really going to comment on that. So look, I mean, that's about it, really. Um, that's what, what's been going on and, and what we've been doing.